I guess at around 25 minutes now, uh, talk about Urban Center for Computation and Data. This is an activity that we started informally about uh, a little over two years ago. As uh, we and looking at the challenges of ur global urbanization and cities growing faster than they ever have before, and as a consequence of that growth, creating infrastructure at rates that we've never seen before. So if you look at countries like China, for example, projects are being built there. Okay. Project being built in China are, uh, they've got to, over the next 20 years, they've got to make room in their cities or create new cities for another 400 million people. So take more than the population of the U.S. That's the number of people moving into cities over the next two decades in China. What that translates to is every year building a new uh, Manhattan. So we have science in various areas that relates to environment, relates to infrastructure, relates to society. And we want to look for ways to apply those sciences to urban growth and to urban situations in general. So the Urban Center for Computation Data involves collaborators at the University of Chicago as well as out at Argonne and a growing number of uh, folks elsewhere. What I want to do is just quickly take you through, I would say, signature projects in each of the three areas that uh, I've laid out here. And, and the purpose of this activity is to look at the impact of urban growth and change on the environment, so water and air and things like that. Look at the impact on infrastructure. If you think about what is happening in China, for example, how they do their transportation infrastructure will directly impact the greenhouse gas emissions of their cities and the energy that they're required, which in turn, both of those things impact us cities in Chicago. And then society, um, how do these uh, new uh, urban areas impact the people that live within them, but also the people around them? Uh, the first project I'll talk about in a moment here is the Lakeside Project, which is just 20 blocks south of here. So that's a new second downtown that's planning to be built there that will have a non-zero impact on all the neighborhoods around it. So we want to understand what that impact is. We're, we're taking three technical approaches to this. First is computational modeling. Can we bring computational models to bear on questions that have long-term implications, whether they're policy or infrastructure design, um, answering questions that we might otherwise have to wait 20 years and spend a billion dollars uh, to figure out uh, that we made the wrong decision. And then the second area is data analytics. There's been an initiative here in Chicago, actually a whole bunch of initiatives around open data over the last couple of years. Chicago's one of the uh, cities around the world that can say we are the leader, or at least a leader, in a small number of cities in publishing operational data about the city. Things like uh, crime databases or um, GPS tracked vehicles are available at the Chicago um, data portal. So we want to take that information and help cities understand how to use that data to make decisions not so much at the 20-year horizon, but more like over months. So a couple of folks in here participated in the Data Science for Social Good prop, uh, in, uh, program last summer, and you know one of their projects was to look at crowding on buses and try to use data, lots of data from the um, people operating buses to figure out how they could change the schedule, the equipment, et cetera, on these bus lines in order to relieve some of that problem. So those would be decisions that without the data would take months to iterate on before you got it right, if you ever got it right. But by using data, you can actually do the iteration sort of using computational models and, and then decide on an optimal solution um, and then try it out. So eliminate lots of, lots of obviously suboptimal uh, solutions. And the third area I want to talk about is embedded systems, which started out a couple years ago as embedded sensors or sensing. Um, and we are still interested in um, putting sensors around cities to understand how they operate, whether that's uh, understanding infrastructure like uh, cars moving around or understanding how pedestrian flows work during uh, major events or, or what have you, air quality. And it's grown out of just sensing to look uh, also at new ways that people might interact with cities 
mediated by embedded information infrastructure. So if all around the city are these devices that provide some kind of information service or a beaconing of some kind, and I can interact with them with my mobile device, there might be new ways that I can interact with the city. And just to give you one example, um, you can navigate around the city right now with a cloud service that requires you to give away all your personal information. So you can navigate as long as you're willing to um, let large companies like Google and certain governments track your every move. Um, but beyond that, you can only navigate uh, in terms of things that don't change every day. So if you're a disabled person in some way, maybe you're blind or, uh, or maybe you're an elderly, elderly person who doesn't get around so well, the Google or Apple navigation will help you get from point A to point B, but it's not going to tell you um, about traffic or number of people in an intersection. So um, similarly, the intersection lights will blink uh, or make a sound that tells you it's safe to cross the intersection, but it's only theoretically safe to cross the intersection. They're not going to tell you that there's a car coming at 30 miles an hour that's not going to stop. So embedding things in the infrastructure, you can imagine new ways to work. Um, to, to interact with cities. So I want to just talk about three projects and one in each of those areas. And the first is something that uh, is called Lake Sim uh, because it is related to the Lakeside Project. Okay, so the Lakeside Project is a 600 acre uh, second downtown that's been talked about ever since the U.S. Steel Plant closed 20 blocks south of here back in the late 1970s. But in the last few years, project is actually started moving forward. We began to work, by, by we I mean some folks here at the CI, some folks at Argonne National Laboratory, we began to work with Skidmore, Hoynes, and Merrill, uh, the architects for the conceptual design that you see on the left here, uh, or that you will see when we give you the slides later if you're dialing in. Um, and then with the developer, McCaffrey Interests, who need to make investment decisions such as um, how do we produce uh, energy for use on the site? And how to what extent can we use renewables? And to what extent do we need a contract with ComEd or PPC and I sort of what have you? So we found in, in interacting with this project that the way that urban planning gets done is really effective when you're planning a single building. And they have the tools and the experience and the infrastructure they, the architects and the urban designers and developers, they know how to do a building. You stretch them to you know uh, 15 acres, something like uh, Lake Shore East, which is that uh, uh, cluster just of, of uh, buildings, apartments, condos, just north of Millennium Park. That's about 20 acres. So they're they're stretching their capability at 20 acres to be able to make decisions, and partly because they try to optimize uh, education, economics, and traffic, and um, uh, uh, economics, they try to optimize those all in their head. They can do that for one building. They're starting to stretch themselves if they're talking about 20 buildings. At 600 acres with over 500 buildings, nobody can keep all that in their head. So the question is, how do you figure out what's going to happen or what the impact of changes will be at a site like this when the site's evolving over 20 years and it's of a scale that you're not used to dealing with? So what we said is, why don't we take some computational models that we know work? and try to marry them together with the tools that are um, used in the architecture and urban planning industry. So what you see on the screen uh, is we've taken the design for the site, which is just a two-dimensional layout of the site, about 16 or so districts on the site, each of which is zoned in a particular way and has a date that is expected to be, uh, to be built. So we've taken that and the uh, conceptual design for the buildings, as I said, about 511 buildings, and we pulled this into a piece of software called Esri, uh, called City Engine from a company called Esri. And then we're doing, we're, we're using the reporting functions of that software to send data out to per building energy modeling software that we can run in workflows, you know, across lots of machines. They do 512 buildings in like a few minutes, like literally like two or three minutes. Uh, and what we could do then, uh, by putting these two things together, is to let the designers and architects begin to explore the sensitivity of the demand for energy at this site with changes in zoning, with changes in timing of these zones. So just for illustrative purposes, at the bottom you see these two knobs of zoning and planning. Um, as you change, say, a commercial zone 
to a residential zone, that will change the amount of energy that that zone will use and the schedule that that zone will use energy. Um, as you change the phasing, that means that as you push parts of the development out in time, you also push out the demand for energy. And so if you want to make decisions about how much capacity to build at what time for energy, or we're talking transportation, which is our next uh, uh, phase of this project, when do you have to ex uh, expand Lakeshore Drive, you want to be able to look at filling those knobs and, and try to figure out what the uh, what the possibility space is. And so what you see in the bottom right um, is uh, not real data. That's a mock-up for this presentation because we're about two months away from having this work the way we want it to work. So full disclosure, this is uh, facsimile uh, functionality. Uh, but what we want is to be able to say, okay, here's the 20 or 30 year profile given this zoning and this climate projection um, and uh, this phasing of the site. And as we move these knobs, you get different projections. And so we want the, the developer then to be able to do that fiddling of knobs and then make uh, decisions about energy supply that are at least informed by some reasonable possibilities. Okay, so that's uh, modeling. Um, the second area is data analytics. So I have a couple things on this slide here. As I mentioned before, um, so Radek Ghani, who's not here at the moment, but came in uh, to the CI uh, and created this wonderful program called Data Science for Social Good. Not strictly urban, but as it turns out, you want to address problems or challenges or opportunities that are society or social good related. Well, um, more than 50% of the population lives in cities, so there's some synergy there, and that, that number is going to go up. So the DSSG program, uh, which will be repeated this summer, took in uh, almost 40 students, uh, fellows, that worked for 12 weeks on a set of data analytics uh, projects with data from external partners like, let's see, this is the Cook County Land Bank, the poster that the students did. Um, they worked with the Chicago Transit Authority. They worked with Mesa Public Schools. Um, to, to, to work with uh, partners that said, we have a bunch of data, we have some business needs to understand some things that we think this data can help us understand. Can you help us figure out how to use this data to answer those questions? The CTA bus project was one of those examples. Um, so as I said, that pro program will be repeated this summer, probably will grow to more like 50 students. And these were students from 22 different universities multiple countries uh, that came in and were mentored in teams of three to four uh, by full-time mentors. Um, in the upper right, you see another project that we're doing in data analytics, and that's with the city of Chicago. So that map that you see there, that heat map, is, is a, a screenshot from something called Windy Grid that when Brett Goldstein was CIO, he was to the U of Chicago uh, last fall, but when he was CIO, he built this capability for the mayor's office to look at real-time data about the city during major events, starting with the National Summit that was almost two years ago. And the idea here was that they pulled in data from lots of different sources, some public and some uh, internal data, for example, the GPS location speed and heading of all of the police cars. That's data that they have internally, but not data that will ever be published. Other public data like weather, or even uh, social network uh, tweets, for example. They pull all this into a geospatial database that will allow them to ask questions of the form, what's happening here right now? And what we worked with them starting about um, 18 months ago, Ian Foster, myself, and others, uh, worked with Brett and his team, and, and, and the current CIO, uh, who was there at the time, Brent Berman, to envision what they would need if they wanted to ask different kinds of questions than just what's happening now, one of the important questions they would want to ask is, can you show us somewhere in the city where something unusual is happening? So to answer that question, you have to do essentially continual data analytics to decide what's typical in this particular area. As an example, in some neighborhoods, one call to 311 a month would be, uh, you know, of, of no particular, no, it's like a typical month, maybe it would even be low. In my neighborhood, a, three, a 911 call in a month is an unusual thing. So you want to tailor the sort of triggers for what is unusual based on what is typically happening in a part of the city. 
So we have a, a number of projects, some funded by NSF, some now funded by an award that the city won with our help from the Blooper uh, Foundation to try to move this capability forward and pulling all these capabilities together so that not only can Chicago uh, run systems that give them this capability, but also other cities. For example, Matt uh, is working with the planning department of the city of San Francisco uh, to take some of the functionality that we have been developing to understand things about places, like the Cook County Land Bank project is a nice example where take a bunch of information about a place and try to uh, try to say something about it, like um, is the property value here going to go up or down if uh, there's more vacancies around. So we're working with other cities as well, and, and to try to design this infrastructure with Brett now that he's not CIO anymore, actually leading the charge in such a way that other cities can either use our capabilities here in Chicago or could replicate them in, in their own cities. So that's two. So the third project is something that uh, we have been working on also for about a couple years now. And as I said, it started look, looking at sensors. And uh, we've done a number of workshops and training sessions, you know, with high school students coming in, building soldering air quality monitors and then trying to put them out in the city. What we, uh, we learned something in the summer of 2012 that has led us to the point of this project we're talking about right here. What we found was that if you want to do urban sensing, there's an easy part and there's a hard part. So the easy part is building a really cool gadget that you might place out somewhere. You know, program it, put some sensors on it, you know, do some mapping and, and all that stuff. That's actually the easy part. What we found in 2012 when we did that easy part was that the really hard part was finding places in a major city like Chicago where you could get a secure place to put it, some power, and network access. That's really hard. And as a result, if you look at any of these maps of do-it-yourself sensors, zoom in on any city, Chicago or otherwise, you'll find that they're all placed in residential areas and none of them are in downtown areas. So we said to the city of Chicago when John Toll was the CTO at the time, and he was working on this strategic uh, technology plan for the city that came out in September of last year. And you know they asked us, well, what's one thing the city could do that would make your research, uh, that would enable you to do more and more, more and better and interesting research? And so what we talked about this, and I said, why don't you have an initiative where the city puts in place a whole bunch of enclosures around the city, secure enclosures, that have network and power to them. And then any group, a university, a company, or whoever, that wants to experiment with city-scale sensors or information systems embedded in the city, can put their devices in those enclosures and do their work. So they thought this was a good idea. It became Initiative 3, and the, there were three uh, infrastructure-related initiatives in the plan. Um, and then uh, last fall, with our colleagues at the School of the Arts of Chicago, we did some design of what those enclosures might look like. So you see the upper left-hand corner here, uh, these things that fit around light poles. And the design, this was a graduate course in architecture and design. The design goals for the students were uh, make something that sits on a light pole, but make it conspicuous and friendly looking, inviting, if you will and design some strategies so that a person walking up to it can interact with it in such a way that they can learn what it's doing and also what it's not doing. So this notion of transparency of what these devices are doing. Um, we saw a number of articles of, like a month ago that came out, Seattle and Las Vegas putting these military looking devices on poles. Nobody knows what they're really doing, you can only guess, and so there's this uh, understandable immediate reaction by the citizens to these devices, and that's not what we want here. What we actually want is for people to be able to walk up to these things and interact with them in, in some way. Maybe um, maybe they hit this big red button that's like the City of Chicago Easy button that you know, tells them cool stuff that's happening in the area or something like that. So we did this prototyping. We're gonna you're gonna actually see some of these on the U Chicago campus uh, as soon as the weather gets a little better better in the spring. Uh, and they have LEDs in, in, uh, inside them, but the idea here is an enclosure around the pole, and inside there would be a set of devices, uh, a master control device, a sensing device that's sensing six or eight different things, uh, a list of things that we're driving by, interacting with 
our colleagues in atmospheric sciences and elsewhere, and then some embedded Linux boxes that you could do experiments. For example, uh, I want to take over 100 Linux boxes at this 10 square block area in Chicago, and if they have Bluetooth brain, I want to listen to the Bluetooth addresses that go by and make some uh, uh, capability that lets people map where the most people are walking through the city. Right? So you should be able to think of an experiment like that, go to somewhere, do a peer review of it, and then be able to use those 100 devices for a week or for six months or what have you. Uh, in addition to the devices we will operate for those kind of experiments, there'll be room in this for individual groups and say, well, that's cool, but we have this really nice device that we designed for our science. Uh, can we put 50 or 500 of them in Chicago? We work with them to get these things installed. So the idea of placing enclosures rather than devices as the goal means that every year we can put the latest and greatest devices out there. And what most people are doing, or most cities are doing in terms of urban sensing, is they're putting a particular device out in the field. That means that 18 months from now, when it's no longer interesting to use that device, they're starting over. So we're building a platform here that with the city allows us to inject technology as it gets better in, in that platform over, over a period of time. All right, so uh, our ambitions are not small. Um, we figure these boxes are going to be a couple thousand dollars each. We figure it's going to cost between $500 and $750 per device to get it mounted. Uh, we're working with the city right now to, they've said uh, that they're they're strongly considering, which is another way of saying they've told us they'll do this, but it's not in writing, um, placing these things at no cost to the project. They'll go probably about three meters off the ground on signal lights, on poles that have signal lights, because street lights don't have power 24 by 7. So what we want to do is by the end of calendar 2014, have about 100 of these. Uh, you can see the red uh, stars in the right-hand uh, corner there that cover the loop and then a corridor down to the McCormick uh, place, that is 200. So think of that, but half as dense. So we want to do that by the fall. Why only 100? For one thing, we want to see how these things with our enclosures and the other things, how these things will survive the winter in Chicago and how good uh, our systems are to be able to manage these devices when inevitably what will happen is. There'll be experiments that happen on them, maybe even stuff that we do, much less somebody else, and we brick a bunch of them. So how do we recover from that? So we're designing those uh, those sort of uh, internal infrastructure for uh, for that kind of robust operation. And then in 2015 and 2016, we want to roll out to what you see in the look in the left hand side there, uh, as that's just to illustrate what would 800 of them look like at every city block. So uh, we're writing a proposal, or we're finishing writing a proposal to NSF that's due next week. Uh, we think we have a good shot at um, getting funding to do this. Uh, even if we don't get funding, we're going to shoot for the 100 devices uh, and try again next year for NSF money if we don't get it. But we've got Intel, Microsoft, Cisco, Schneider Electric, and Zebra Technologies uh, all working with us and saying, yeah, let's try to do this in 2014. And if the money comes from NSF, great. That'll help us go further in 20. So, uh, good. that's about half an hour. Um, you should know that James and I coordinated so that these would be seamless, a seamless pair of talks. Seamless, seamless. Uh, and, and what we decided to do is we're both giving our talks in English. So that gives a real sort of nice transition from one to the other. And I understand James actually might have slides. Uh, for those of you at the other end of the camera. Is that true? Well, I'm, 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 right. I'm, not, I'm not sure if we're accessible to anybody. But yeah, I'll see you. <laughs> okay, so uh, Jake, you want to work in, uh, I'll unplug if you have a lot of questions while we're transitioning. I'm happy to answer. Yeah. Is providing public Wi Fi access a possibility for these devices? Because you said they're going to have network access. Uh, uh, so the city is going to roll out public Wi Fi. Um, we and the CIO for the city are trying to keep this infrastructure separate from anything that's operational or, or, or commercial. And so it may be that they go ahead and stick city Wi-Fi on the same poles and use the same power, but that will be a separate operation that the city does. Similarly, if Cisco or Intel or startup company XYZ 
does some research on here and then wants to roll out a product or a service, mm -hmm. that will go in these devices either. So it would be strictly for uh, research. And it could be proprietary commercial research. But also, the city will learn, I think, a lot, as will the companies, on what's the best way to provide them to buy by a company. Is there a pushback from the city that these poll would be too ugly? Uh, okay, I'm, I'm not going to be offended by the fact that you just call my enclosures ugly. I'm not saying they're ugly. I'm just saying this will be a new kind of poll that would be kind of everywhere. Uh, so, so um, street polls are pretty ugly, as it turns out, already. <laughs> you know, they have like big boxes with cables sticking out and going up to them and stuff like that. Um, the design that we came up with, that I'll say our colleagues at the School of the Arts came up with, is um, it's a it's parameter-based design, so they can vary the number of sides to the enclosure, the size of the enclosure, um, and and it really part of the work with the Chicago here is to make them not ugly and actually sort of invite them. So the idea of using LEDs inside, both for aesthetic reasons, but also to think of ways that you might use LEDs as a communication mechanism for passers-by. Uh, so, so but but yeah, the city is concerned about aesthetics as well, and that's part of. There was a rule under um, the previous mayor Daly that you couldn't put anything on the decorative light fixtures in the downtown area. Um, and that is not really a law, it's just that was what the previous administration did. But if we do it on signal poles, you know, not an issue. One question is, is there any privacy issues? Yeah, you know, so, um, there's a ton of privacy issues in putting embedded systems into any city. And this is part of the reason that um, if, if you look at, not public, but in our proposal, there's a whole bunch of technical and engineering um, research that we need to do to build this. Um, but we're bringing in um, social and behavioral scientists, and then we want to bring in community groups to help us design these things so that they are transparent. And um, so that that's why when you walk up to this thing, you should be able to tell, even if you don't have a smartphone, what is this thing doing, or where do I find out more about it? So transparency is the first step in being very aggressive in communicating about these things. Uh, the part about neighborhoods, um, are the part about the design being parameter-based, uh, we would ideally like to actually work with neighborhoods to say, hey, here's some designs. What would you like to see in your neighborhood, and we'll make them that way. Um, so transparency is the first thing, and then we've got to continually work on Trust because transparency is fine if you trust what's being you know, given to you. So that that means involvement by community groups in what we're doing, and we, we expect that we'll, we'll learn a lot about that as we go forward. Like for example, the, the thing you said about monitoring Bluetooth addresses, like that data would be anonymized, so you would be able to. Track yeah, it um, I, I want to turn it over to James, so but, but this is a really important topic. So so part of the review of what happens in these boxes, the city will be involved. We will be involved. At least several community group members will be involved. Is at no time do we want things happening in these devices that we don't know is happening. So hardware review, software review. You know, we can't deal with if somebody hacks in and does something we don't know about. You know, it's possible that would happen. Um, but if you're going to monitor addresses, yes, we would say no saving, anonymized. That's right. Thank you.